Hello, readers in the research, education, advocacy world. Welcome to the Read Podcast, where we connect you with researchers, educators, and thought leaders who share their expertise on education and child development. Okay, spring is upon us. I feel like I need to spring forward here because I'm thrilled to be joining, entering the spring with none other than Dr. Colby Hall. Dr. Hall, welcome to the Read Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. We're honored to have you. I mean, I've been fangirling you since I saw you in fall in October 2023 at the Reading League Conference. I've known your research in a while, but that was the first time I saw you speak. And so I'm really excited to dive into more about your expertise. But before we get into that, how are you showing up to this conversation? How are you feeling? Are you excited for spring as much as I am? I am excited for spring. And it's actually fun. I grew up on the East Coast and, you know, now I'm in Virginia. So I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, And so moving back to the East Coast was kind of fun to like get some of the flora and fauna from my childhood. But it is also nice that spring comes a little bit earlier in Virginia than it did in Philadelphia. So um, I feel like I'm already starting to see signs of spring here. Very exciting. And that spring breeds end of the semester and I think I what I love also about being in higher ed and and actually just in schools is when we get to the end of the semester or school year, we can kind of celebrate the culmination of what we've learned. And so we'll try and model that here, too. Perhaps we can model this next hour as a um, culminating all the things that we that you've learned in your research and share a little bit more as all of our educators and families and everyone who listens to this podcast truly approaches the end of the school year. Um, And I also know before we get into the conversation that you are also joining me for tea time. I have my mug, my favorite mug now. Um, What does your mug look like? So my mug has nothing on it, unfortunately. (laughs) But um, but I really did find so I was um, telling Danielle in the beginning of the before we started recording that I didn't have my tea, even though I was supposed to have tea with me. But um, but I found my cold tea from this morning, so it'll be good. I'll have a little extra caffeine. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. I love that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, everyone, if you are listening or watching us on YouTube, feel free to bring a tea mug as well. I've never invited anyone to do that, but I feel like now we need to just invite all of the readers to also join us on tea. So feel free to do that. And as you are getting your tea, I am going to formally introduce our guest, Dr. Hall. So I'll read your bio for those that don't know much about Dr. Hall or just learning more about you. So Dr. Colby Hall studies literacy development, assessment, and instruction. Her research focuses on the components of effective literacy instruction for elementary and middle school students with or at risk for literacy learning difficulties, inference instruction as means of improving reading comprehension, reading instruction for bilingual or multilingual students with reading difficulties, instruction supporting text comprehension and content area classrooms, and technology-delivered reading instruction. Okay, just a little preview for all of our readers. I had such a difficult time making all my questions so concise because of all of the different avenues we can get into for this conversation. So I'm excited to dive into a little bit of each of those topics. So Dr. Hall also is currently the co-PI of an Institute of Education Sciences-funded projects that aims to further develop and pilot the reading rules for kindergarten, small group literacy innovation program. I know that you also have a program working with multilingual students, as well as um, working with school leaders with web-based coaching to support teachers of students with disabilities in delivering evidence-based academic vocabulary instruction. You can find Dr. Hall's peer-reviewed articles and publications on a variety of um, different, I guess, peer-reviewed journals and databases. And we'll have a lot of her resources linked on the podcast, the Read Podcast website. So formal bio, I need to dive in further about your story. Tell us more about your professional journey, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I was um, a general education elementary school teacher for five years before um, I enrolled in a PhD program in special education at UT Austin. Um, with Sharon Vaughn. Um, and I think, you know, to go back to my decision to become a teacher, um, I had always wanted to be a teacher. I think I had wonderful teachers myself growing up in in elementary school and middle school. 
Um, and I also, I remember reading a book by Jonathan Kozel. I think it maybe was required reading before I enrolled as an undergrad. And um, it was Savage Inequalities. And um, I think that had a really big impact on me. It talked a lot about sort of structural inequities in the United States in terms of access to educational um, opportunities and access to high quality education. And so I sort of, you know, I was an idealistic young person and I wanted to make a difference in the world. And I felt like this was my, you know, the best way for me to make a difference was to sort of learn how to become, learn how to be a high quality teacher and then work in some of the under-resourced sorts of under-resourced communities that Jonathan Kozel wrote about. Um, that was why I wanted to be a teacher. And the the problem is that I, so I didn't have any opportunity to take courses in education as an undergrad. Um, in my master's degree program, I learned so much, so much wonderful, important stuff about, um, you know, sort of more about these structural inequities. Um, I learned a lot about kind of theories that helped me understand all of the funds of knowledge that kids bring to the classroom. I could go on for a long time about all the wonderful stuff that I did learn, but I didn't learn a whole lot about kind of the nuts and bolts of early literacy development and how to build foundational skills in kids. So when I started off teaching in um, a third grade classroom in New York City, I felt so underprepared to help my kids who were having difficulties learning to read and spell, still having difficulties with reading and spelling in third grade. And I remember like it was yesterday, even though it was, you know, 20 some years ago, you know, just like believing so much in these kids and even having these parent teacher conferences where parents expressed concerns about kids and just telling them like, your kids are so wonderful. They're going to, I believe in them, you know, but not not knowing, you know, what I needed to know really in order to help them to, and prepare them to be successful in school. So, um, so that was a really hard experience for me. And I learned a lot along the way, but when I enrolled in this PhD program, I specifically chose to work with Sharon Vaughn and, you know, so that I could better understand what is evidence-based practice for kids with difficulties learning to read. Um, so that I think is a way of sort of describing how I got there. You are right. I My research has been a little bit all over the place because working with Sharon Vaughn in my doctoral degree program, I focused almost entirely on middle and high school aged kids and content area reading comprehension. And then in my first faculty position at um, University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, I focused almost entirely on um, sort of early literacy, um, preschool and kindergarten, really primarily kindergarten, and a wide variety of skills, but really primarily code-focused skills. So I, my research has been a little bit all over the place, but I'm eager to talk about whatever you would like to talk about here. <laughs> I would argue it's not all over the place. It's comprehensive, right? That you, I think what's so unique about your work, and when I have learned more about your work and reading a lot of the papers that you've written, or co-authored in your the projects that you're working on is you're getting this you can see this developmental trajectory right you're working with kindergartners and you've also worked with adolescents right and when you add in a lot of the other pieces of comprehension and code focus focus skills i mean you're just a walking scarborough reading rope what i think <laughs> you know and then i think adding to the the piece with english learners is also something i want to dive into and so I appreciate you sharing that trajectory. And then let's just add the fact that you've been in education. You've been a classroom teacher, so you know what it's like and the experiences that teachers have had. I think you shared a lot of sentiments that a lot of our past guests have had. Certainly I've had. I've talked about it where you're going through teacher prep programs and not quite getting what you need to service your kids. And I also like how you talked about when you were in parent-teacher conferences, I think every teacher sees the wonderful potential of their kids, right? And they want to provide that instruction. And so, you know, in READ and a lot of the things that we do at the Institute is to shed light on those practices that are high quality, that are evidence-based, so students, teachers can be much more informed um, and have the agency to do so. So with that little diatribe, 
Let me take a little sip of my my tea. But before, actually, I'll take it afterwards. I want to dive in first with the reading rules. So I talked about in your bio and you talked about your work with kindergartners that you are the co-principal investigator with Trisha Zucker on a research grant called Reading Rules, um, which is a small group intervention program of kindergartners in Texas. And it's focused on these code reading skills, te- word reading, text and language comprehension, and writing. So can you share more about the project itself and the rationale behind this grant? So Carolyn Denton, who was at uh, the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, was the one who actually initially proposed the project to IES. And I remember her telling me, and I should say, and then she retired and I became PI of the project. Then I left UT Health and Trisha Zucker at UT Health became PI of the project but I was co-PI from UVA. And then Mike Mesa joined sort of later on in the project, and he was a co-investigator. And so it was this great team. I, it was this wonderful experience of collaborating in all of the years of the project. But I do think it's important to note that Carolyn Denton was the one who proposed the project to IES. And I remember her telling me that the thing she was most excited about, and the, the reason that she really feel like felt like it got funded, Um, was that it proposed to incorporate early writing instruction alongside of early reading instruction for kindergartners. Um, And the idea was that there are very few tier two interventions that provide support for kindergartners, really young kids showing initial signs of being at risk for reading difficulties, and even fewer, um, maybe none, that provide integrated reading and writing instruction alongside of oral language supports. So the idea was to develop an intervention of this type and then see how feasible it was for classroom teachers to implement and whether it showed initial evidence of promise in a pilot study. Mm. And so as you continued the study, right, how many years has this been going on for? So it's finished now, actually. Okay. We completed the pilot study last year, um, and then we had sort of an additional no-cost extension year or so. The pilot study needed to be delayed by one year because of COVID. Um, Then we conducted the study, and then we needed a little extension to do all the data analyses and write up the results. But the paper um, reporting the results of that pilot study is accepted for publication and will be out in the world soon. Excellent. Oh, we're excited to read that. And we'll add that to the Read Podcast website when it's available. So it's done, right? And so you have had you've you have this body of research findings. What I find interesting about this study in particular was this intention for the integrated word reading, comprehend, language comprehension, and writing. So can you talk a little bit more about the components you focused on or you emphasized? And particularly, I think it's fascinating with this intervention, right? I've all of these students you had screened for reading difficulties, kind of getting ahead of myself. Let's do the components first, and then I want to ask more about the the actual group of kindergartners that you were working with. Yeah, so we did screen kids at the beginning of the school year, and we only were, you know, included students in the study who um, were at risk for difficulties based on, I think in all years of the study, we used Dibble's phoneme segmentation fluency and Dibble's letter naming as like Mm -hmm. the initial Mm -hmm. screening measure. So it was kids who showed some initial trouble with phoneme segmentation and with their letter names. Mm -hmm. And that's, oh, thank you. Thank you for that um, background. I think that's important. And I think interesting that you focused particularly on kindergarten. Um, So what were those components of the intervention that you prioritized? And I'm so sorry if that was the beach. I'm no, so it's okay. Sorry. That was the question I was supposed to answer. I got slightly dis- distracted by a text that just showed up on my screen. Oh, no worries. Okay. The components were phonological awareness was uh, one component. There were so many components. And I will say, you know, I'm now getting ahead of myself too, but, um, you know, one of the chal- big challenges was for teachers was fitting this in during the day. We can talk more about that later, but, you know, Part of the challenge for us, too, was fitting everything in. It was intended to be a 20-minute session, four days a week. And we wanted to cover phonological awareness, letter names and sounds. And sometimes there were slightly more complex graphing phoneme correspondences, you know, like CK makes the K sound. But mostly it was just single letter, you know, 
phoneme graphing correspondences. Um, decoding, and kids would decode in the context of single isolated words, but they would also read connected text. And there were these great decodable texts that were part of the intervention. They're published by Flyleaf. I don't know if you know the, these Flyleaf publishing decodables, but they're wonderful. There was also an encoding or spelling component, and students would also write. So not just, they wouldn't just encode single words, but they would write entire complete sentences, you know, with a capital at the beginning and a punctuation mark at the end. Um, and usually they were writing in response to what they had read. Um, there was an oral language component, vocabulary instruction, and also just oral response to text, um, a reading comprehension component, and a handwriting component as well. Wow. And so what did you learn? Like, can you give us a little bit about the findings? You know, and let me just reiterate some of those pieces again from this more integrated approach, the word reading, decoding, the phonological awareness piece, language and comprehension, handwriting, spelling, and writing, right? So what did, what are some of the things that you found from this study? And share maybe a little bit of the findings that will be in the paper. Yeah. So one thing that I always think is important to say is that, um, and I know I mentioned this briefly earlier, the pilot study, the, which was a random, very small randomized control trial, um, was meant to be meant to start in the fall of 2020. Because of COVID, that couldn't happen, um, as you can imagine. So we delayed the study for a year, and then we implemented it during the 2021-2022 school year. Actually, time goes so quickly, I can't believe that's when it was. But I, it was, even then, it was a really stressful time for teachers to be implementing a brand new intervention. So it was, it was hard for us to recruit teachers to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. And then in the schools where we were able to recruit successfully, teachers were understandably under a lot of stress and feeling really exhausted. There were a lot of teacher and student absences. Teachers and students were masked for most of the year. Mm -hmm which is especially challenging during PA and phonics instruction. Um, so that was a really hard context in which to be con conducting this study. And so I think it's, so one of our big findings is that we didn't get a very high dosage of implementing the intervention. Teachers just mm -hmm. didn't, weren't able to do those four 20 minute sessions each week. So um, I think that was in some ways a product of the context in which we conducted the study. But I do think it's important to be honest with ourselves that even if we hadn't been implementing during COVID, I do think we underestimated the degree to which it's so hard for kindergarten. Most of these kindergarten teachers did not have, were not provided by their you know school administration with like an additional supplemental time to deliver tier two instruction to their students who sh were showing initial signs of having some difficulty. So they were trying to implement this tier two intervention during the core reading block, often during kind of small group time. And it was just really hard for them to fit it in. Um, it's hard to do 20 minutes with one small group of kindergartners and find something for other all the other kindergartners in your room to do productively. Um, so, and it's also just, you know, they were often having to find, to use sort of a different curriculum to provide small group instruction to their other small groups. And then, you know, learning this whole separate curriculum. Anyway, I could go on for a little bit longer about all of the barriers to implementation. Um, and, and that was, I think, an important finding in and of itself. Um, I think probably it will be important to have instructional aides or tutors or some kind of non-classroom teacher interventionist available to um, implement tier two instruction with, um, with kindergarten aged kids um, in future studies. Or there just needs to be a tier two supplemental intervention time carved out during the school day. Um, and, and then it might be possible for classroom teachers to be the implementers. Um, but so that was sort of the first important finding to mention. And then the second finding is that 
students in the treatment condition didn't do better than students in the comparison condition on average. So it's important to be really honest about that. You know, part of the reason is that students in the treatment condition didn't actually receive a whole lot of the intervention. Um, and we did show that dosage of implementation was associated with gains on measures of word reading. Um, so that was that's really important to mention. And um, improvement in student outcomes depended in particular on students' delivery of lessons. It, they had to get to like what we called phase three, which was past week 10, which was, you know, when the decodable books were first introduced and when students had more opportunities to really practice um, retrieving knowledge of letter sounds, forming letters, um, decoding, reading those decodable texts, and writing whole words and sentences. So some teachers just did not even get that far. And in that case, you know, implementation wasn't associated with gains. So I think th those are sort of the somewhat, somewhat demoralizing findings. But but I guess the the positive thing is that, you know, receiving this kind of an instructional intervention is associated with gains as long as you get enough of it. And so we just have to find some way for students to get enough of it in, in kindergarten classrooms. I love how you walked me through that story. I think the beauty of, of you know, what we're now calling, or I guess it's not, we're not now calling it, it's been around for decades, but the beauty of implementation science, for example, is you get to shed light and almost broadcast the window of the process of research. Um, and I really appreciate how you walked me through what you intended to do and the fidelity of how it was maintained through delivery in schools. Um, I also really appreciated how you brought in this concept of doing research in the natural settings of school environments. I mean, what a unfathomable challenge to just hit the ground running in fall of 21, right? right. Um, we were doing some research. We partnered with um, Yale Haskins Global Literacy Hub on so an in-school neuroscience project. And we had to navigate some of that too. I think researchers around the world echo those same feelings. Um, but I think the pieces that you spoke about with the barriers on time and dosage uh, mattering, I think is just drool. Like I have light bulbs going off like everywhere, right? And it reminded me of the meta-analysis that you um, had authored with a number of your colleagues on interventions for dyslexia, right? And dosage being a key finding there, right? And so I think for those of us that are listening, educators in particular, there's so many pieces where a lot of the challenges you're experiencing, me as a classroom teacher says, me too, right? And I think that's such a great way to say, okay, now what? how do we move forward with this? What are the implications, right? On dosage and teacher training and providing that time for tier two instruction. Um, I think the finding of word reading is really interesting as well, specifically in our early struggling readers based on some of the risks that they showed. So I appreciate you walking us through that. And I do know from our um, conversation prior to this recording that you were going to use some of that um, findings or, or a lot of what you've been doing with reading rules, for example, you're now moving into supporting English learners, right? So I know you're the PI on an Office of Special Education Programs funded project where you're using this as a technology-based intervention for emergent bilingual elementary school students, yes? Yes. So... And I'm really excited about this Office of Special Education Programs grant, which just I just learned about in late last summer. Um, but it, you're exactly right. So the previous intervention, this Reading Rules Kindergarten intervention, is kind of incorporated into this um, existing technology-based intervention that is the starting point for this OSEP grant. Um, but folks at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston have made it much better. So they've taken all of the work done by Carolyn Denton and, and Trisha Zucker and, and others, and they've put these uh, sort of new iterations of these lessons online. It's now called Arrow. Um, one thing that's really neat is that I, it was always a big challenge for teachers to organize all of the materials involved in this mm -hmm. intervention because, you know, there were just all these letter sound cards or irregular 
word cards or vocabulary cards or magnetic letter tiles, which are the worst to keep track of. You know? <laughs> and you have to pull different magnetic letter tiles for each yeah. group that you're working with. And it's really hard. Um, so now um, not only are the lessons themselves online with like hyperlinks to each activity that students will be engaging in or that teachers will be demonstrating, but there are, you know, digital versions of the letter sound cards and of the letter tiles and of all the rest. So it still is a teacher delivered intervention. Um, and the, the teacher has a laptop where they can follow the lesson plan. And then the teacher has an iPad where they show the students, you know, if, if they're doing like demonstrating some activity and then each student has their own iPad um, and they can engage in, you know, teacher guided and, and group and independent practice on their iPads. So hopefully I described that, you know, sort of the existing technology based intervention. Okay. And then our before we get to that, I just have a, this one like thing that you mentioned. I appreciate you clarifying a lot of that because I think the other piece, I think that's so unique about this, the reading rules and the intervention that, moved into this program is that there was this continuous look of looking at data and improving and this continuous end model of making sure that improvement was it was applicable for teachers, it could be delivered, that you were pairing it with resources. I think one thing that we always think about, right, with new curriculum change or professional development models is what are the resources that are going to be tangible for teachers? And then the thing that piqued my interest was this aspect of instructional coherence between the different skills of reading and literacy. And then this tech-based thing too. So that I think now leads us into the setting for English learners. Yes, it, yeah. exactly. Um, and I, ha I have been really impressed by the iteration. So I've been a small part when I was at UT Health um, in sort of the iteration, but the iteration across more than a decade working on this program is has been really impressive and always in response to data collected and, you know, feedback from both consultants and, you know, teachers and students and administrators. It's been really impressive. Um, but so, yes, to get to the, the OSEP project, the purpose is to embed in this existing online curriculum supports for emergent bilingual students. And in particular, we focus on Spanish speaking emergent bilingual mm -hmm. students and their teachers. Um, and so it's a five-year project. The first two years are called development years. The second, you know, year three and four are called pilot years. And then the last year is a dissemination year. Um, and so our job this year and next year are to develop and collect a lot of feedback on some of the supports for Spanish-speaking emergent bilingual students. What we're working on in particular is a PD module for, for teachers. Um, and then we have some multimedia supports, like there's there will be an audio button on each of the vocabulary cards. We're actually working really hard. We just met with Maria Carlo last week and she gave us lots of good advice on how we can sort of leverage students' Spanish language knowledge to um, have them better access their the um, English vocabulary word. Um, and so that was really interesting. So we'll have this audio button. We'll, we're also developing videos that involve students in, in moving their bodies around. It's sort of like an attempt to get your wiggles out and practice some of the vocabulary knowledge that's been taught in the unit. And then we have some, um, some scaffolds embedded in the lessons themselves um, that are meant to support teachers. Wow. That's really cool. I'm excited to see how that continues. And I like how you brought, you broke down the years too, from not only from the initial concept to dissemination. Are there, I know you mentioned vocabulary and we've had Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen on the podcast. I think a lot of our read listeners are interested in the implications for reading instruction on English learners. So are, is there an emphasis more on the vocabulary and the oral language, or how did you sort of conceptualize it based on your research of emergent bilingual students? Yeah, we, so far, we have um, had a dual focus. We we mm -hmm. are focusing on kind of code-focused skills. Um, you know, th these will be 
students in grades K through three. So there, it will also be important to provide explicit code focused instruction alongside of language comprehension instruction. But of course, because these are emergent bilingual students, we are, there is a big focus on vocabulary and language comprehension generally. Um, so I don't know if that helps. One, one thing that's really that we're grappling with right now as we talk with consultants, Sharon Vaughn and Doris Baker are also consultants for us right now. And it's been really interesting to talk with them about this. Um, but is the extent to which we want to, for example, with phonics instruction, it can be really useful, I think, for teachers to know, you know, when, when they're doing phonological awareness instruction, as well as phonics instruction, when a phoneme is not present at all in Spanish, an English phoneme isn't present at all in Spanish, um, then it might be, especially depending on how old the kids are, it might be a little harder for kids to, um, you know, um, pronounce that phoneme. Maybe you shouldn't ever expect them to pronounce the phoneme the way their native English speaking peers would. Um, and it may be a little harder to, to, you know, cement that grapheme phoneme correspondence in memory. Similarly, there are um, times where there is a phoneme that is present in Spanish and English, but the grapheme typically associated with that phoneme is different in English and Spanish. And so it can be helpful to alert teachers to that, partly just so that when a student makes like a really common error that actually demonstrates like that they are spelling a sound correctly in Spanish, let's say, it can be helpful to provide praise, you know, like nice work, you know, you spelled that sound exactly right in Spanish. And in English, you know, especially in this English word, English is hard because there are like often multiple ways of spelling a given sound. But, you know, in this word, we spell the sound with, you know, and provide some pr corrective feedback too. But so, you know, we, we could do a lot of work helping teachers leverage students' Spanish language knowledge, both in the context of phonics instruction and in the context of vocabulary instruction. But then there's also a lot of work that we can do just helping teachers like provide, um, you know, scaffold oral language responses in a way that will, you know, support kids who may need additional levels of scaffolding that don't involve leveraging Spanish, if that makes sense. Um, so like sort of finding the right balance between how much do we want to focus on some of these kind of cross-linguistic connections and leveraging Spanish, and how much do we just want to focus on evidence-based practice for um, all emergent bilingual students? Yeah, I like how you broke that down too and offered those clear implications. I'm reminded of this idea of like structured multiliteracy, right? Where you talked about this explicit code fo focus instruction with analyzing cross linguistic features and some other aspects of like scaffolding oral language and vocabulary. Is there anything else that you'd want to add or clarify or explain, especially in, in how you're developing this particular study? I wonder, I mean, maybe one thing to say is that I'm really grateful to be working with Trisha Zucker and some of the other folks at UT Health who are collaborating on this project because she has done a lot of work in the language domain. She developed developing talkers alongside of other wonderful colleagues. And um, they, so they have like a wealth of knowledge, I think, on um, supporting language development. And so we really leaned heavily on their knowledge for that that part of this project. Thank you for sharing that. Again, cue to our readers, the readers in this, the read universe, also Tim Odegaard said, calls them ear readers because, you know, they're listening and they're read, you know, they're listening to the read podcast. But anyways, the, the one thing that our read listeners know is just how much we prioritize and emphasize language, good language instruction in addition to code focus instruction. Um, so I'm happy that you brought that in. So we're now going to switch. Do I? Have, do you have any other thoughts related to English learners? If not, I want to switch to part three of this podcast and talk about PACT and your work with adolescent readers. That sounds great. Okay. Usually I have a much more fluid transition, but 
if our readers didn't kind of catch on to this, we wanted to focus on the kindergarten the reading rules, talk a little bit more about implications for English learners. And in the final part of this episode, we're going to talk about your work with adolescents. So you had said that you had worked with um, Dr. Sharon Vaughn at UT Austin on PACT, which is Promoting Adolescent Comprehension of Text. And that's when I saw you speak at the Reading League with Dr. Capen. I just loved the framework. I was immediately gravitated towards the framework. And I will say that um, a lot of the components, I think I drew a lot of parallels to, to my work teaching at at the Windward School, that there is this clear framework and emphasis to, again, this instructional coherence and this explicit modeling and practice of skills and knowledge. And so before I just kind of give it away, can you talk more about PACT and the particularly, is it like a, a methodology? Is it um, a method of instructional procedures? And where would you see PACT being, I guess, enacted in classrooms? Yeah, this is such a good question. And I should say, I am such a small part of this PACT work. You know, I was on a very small part of the team when I was a doctoral student at UT Austin, but there are others Letty Martinez, Elizabeth Swanson, and then of course Sharon has led the work. And Jade Wexler and Elizabeth Swanson and Sharon and Letty, I think, I actually don't know exactly who are all the people involved in the different iterations, but are working on a PACT Plus version of PACT, um, doing a model demonstration project in, in schools. So there's there's so much PACT work, and I feel like I'm just this very small piece of it. Um, but I I was, it was a really great opportunity for me to be involved. Now I feel like I'm forgetting your, your actual question though. It was. Okay, uh, good. Yeah. Let's, let's, so I'll re I'll restate it just because, you know, people, I think it's good, good to always remind people of the initial question. So I want to know, and I will say this, I think what's so great about this talking about PAC2 is shedding light on the research that um, promotes adolescent comprehension. When I was um, teaching at Windward, I taught fifth through eighth grade. And I knew, uh, you know, I didn't, obviously I knew that this, that research in reading didn't just stop at, at grade five. But, you know, that's a common misconception of like, hey, there's a lot of focus on phonics and early, and early reading. What about our adolescent readers? So I'm excited for you to shed light on this. So with that being said, I guess the question is, is PAC more of a, of a framework? Is it a set of instructional procedures and what content areas or what areas of the classroom would PACT really be used in? Yeah. I mean, I I think Sharon often describes it as an, an instructional approach. Mm. Um, there are materials that have been developed through the Meadows Center and, you know, you know, so you can use these specific social studies. I think they're all U.S. history, you know, spiral bound, you know, texts that that have questions embedded and um, knowledge application activities. So, but but it is an approach that you can bring to any text, really. And I would say, and and I should interrupt myself again to say there also are lessons that Jade and Elizabeth and others have developed for science texts. I think that was the OSEP model demonstration work, the PACT Plus work um, that they did. Um, but really any text in any content area classroom, it could be English literature, it could be science, it could be social studies. I do think it probably works best for science and social studies. The components, so there's this comprehension canopy in the very beginning that's kind of an introduction to the topic of the text, maybe a quick knowledge building sort of a thing. Um, often there's a motivational element to it. So you could show um, a couple of images, a short video clip, or something that kind of grabs students' attention um, and builds knowledge. Um, and then the teacher introduces um, like a comprehension. I think in impact it's called, um, I forget, let's call it a comprehension question, but it, it's like a big overarching question. An essential question, right? Essential question. Yeah, yeah. I yes. Think that's exactly right. Um, that um, is, so it should be engaging, thought-provoking. It's something that can focus students thinking through the entire unit. 
Um, ideally, it can be answered in multiple ways so that students can kind of discuss and debate possible answers to this essential question by drawing on text evidence. Mm. Uh, so that's the first component is this comprehension canopy. Then the second component are essential words where you're, you know, providing explicit vocabulary instruction and lots of opportunities to engage with these words in multiple contexts. Then kind of the the big, the meat of the biggest component is the reading and discussion and students, so students read the text. And then usually there are these stopping points in the text where the teacher embeds questions, maybe that are specific questions that alert students to important inferences they need to make or um, guide students to articulate kind of the main idea of a paragraph. Or they could be generic questions like, you know, what's going on now? Or, you know, what did we learn in this paragraph? Or how does this connect to what we read before? But the idea is that there are stopping points where you can kind of discuss and digest a little bit as you read. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are two last components. One is this team-based learning comprehension check, which involves um, it, the way that we did it when I was at UT Austin was that there were these cool um, like lottery cards, you know, with like foil that you would scratch off. And yeah. so this team-based learning approach is was developed by Michelson and Sweet for college classrooms. And so mm -hmm. this packed team adapted it the same approach for use in middle school. Basically, individual students have these scratch off cards or or maybe the the scratch off cards isn't until the team part. So individual students have the five questions and they answer on their own. So it provides some individual accountability. And then they get into their small group and maybe that's when they have their cool little foil scratch off um, lottery card. And they discuss the, what they think are the answers to each question. And they make sure that there's consensus, that they build consensus before they scratch anything off as a team, um, which involves some discuss. You know, you have to sort of help kids learn how to build consensus, right? And how to have a discussion where they may agree or disagree with each other and how to draw on text evidence when there's disagreement, you know, to support mm. their, their argument. So then they, they, when they all agree on an answer, then they scratch it off. And if there's a little star behind the thing, then they know they got the right answer. If they didn't, then it's back to the drawing board and discussing and debating and choosing the next option. But the idea is it, it, it is motivating and um, it provides students with just more opportunity to discuss text, to build comprehension. Um, so that's that. And then there are these knowledge team-based learning knowledge application activities, which often involve writing. Um, sometimes they don't. I remember a really great one that was like a, um, a gosh, I want, now I'm it's like a tournament almost, like a, um, like causes of the American Revolution. And it was like, which cause did students think was the most important one? And, uh, and then they would, you know, proceed to the, you know, court of finals, semifinals, finals, and like they would choose which cause they thought was the most important cause. And students really like that one. But um, anyway, the idea is that you're, you're answering that essential question during the application activity during this. And, and again, because you're doing it as a team, you're having opportunities to, um, to talk and build comprehension together. So mm. uh, so those are the components. And I guess I just went through the components because I thought it was useful. I was sort of thinking aloud, but I, I think that any of those components you can do in the context of any set of texts, any sort of unit in science or social studies. I love that. I think that my next question was, what do you think uh, teachers could really take away from that? And I think that's it. I think that when you lay out this framework you and you have texts, you can make that connection between using that text to facilitate comprehension through this step-by-step -step method, right? That I love the engagement of knowledge building and motivation and vocabulary and multi-strategy st skill instruction. And, and again, it brings me back to this integrated content literacy approach, right? That you can almost bring this marriage of, not almost, but 
you're facilitating knowledge building and skill building for comprehension in the content areas. And I, it energizes me so much. Um, the reason why too, is when I was teaching again at Windward, we had a very similar methodology approach, we would say in terms of how you laid out each lesson, right? And ours uh, is based in a like more of explicit seven step explicit instruction, but you can see, I definitely can see the links without getting too much into it. But again, you see the, um, my, my uh, siren is going off as I'm talking about it because <laughs> I live in New York. I don't know if you can hear it and probably our readers can't, but every time when I'm recording the podcast, inevitably I hear a siren right when I'm in the middle of like a peak thought. But um, <laughs> to, to return back to what I was saying is, again, you see these critical components of knowledge building, motivation, vocabulary, strategy, multiple strategy development, questioning, comprehension, monitoring, and then this check for understanding through this team-based approach is something that I think is really interesting. So thank you for laying that out there. Um, we have a few more minutes and I have a few more questions for you. And so based on what you laid out, and I know that again, like your research is so comprehensive and deep in, in scope. And so I'd like to know from where you are now, what is exciting you about the future of your research, the future of maybe implementation science or education to support literacy for all children? Oh, this is such a good question. Um, I mean, I've had, because I've had these really wonderful collaborators in my life, I, I think I've been pushed to move in a lot of different directions. And recently, at UVA through some work with Emily Solari, um, I've had the opportunity to work on a teacher knowledge survey, which is a whole other oh. area that I hadn't ever gotten into before. And I still think I'm trying to better understand. So, so I, I did lead an effort to develop a survey that measured knowledge, not only within like knowledge to support students reading development, not only within sort of code focused domains, which has been primarily where the focus has been on these sorts of knowledge surveys, but also within language focused mm. domains. Um, so that was really interesting. I think I'm still trying to understand sort of how useful these surveys can be when um, when we don't know necessarily. And Tim Odegaard and and Emily Binks Kentrell, and there are a number of others, you know, working to develop and uh, kind of test the not only to develop and assess teachers' knowledge in you know all of these different domains as well, but also to see whether there are associations between teacher knowledge and teacher practice and student gains, because there hasn't been like a super clear connection between those things in the past. Um, but that, I think that was a really interesting opportunity for me to grow it was, is Emily was sort of, it was her idea to do this teacher knowledge survey. And I don't think I would have ever, you know, embarked on this project if, if it hadn't, if it hadn't been for her sort of pushing me along to do it. But I think it was really interesting. And I've become interested too in measuring teachers' knowledge. You know, what what sorts of knowledge are important when you're teaching emergent bilingual students? Um, and can you show associations between that knowledge and student gains? You know, because you can only really say that that knowledge is important if it's associated with improvement in practice in a way that also then is subsequently shown to improve student outcomes, you know? Um, so that's one area that I'm eager to move into um, or, you know, to continue doing work on. Um, and it's such a good question. Sometimes I think I'm so head down working on, you know, the project you're working on right now that it's, it is actually useful to step back and say, like, what do I think is really important? Where do I want to go in the big picture? Um, and I don't know if I have a perfect answer for that question, but I am really excited about this OSEP work that I'm doing right now in terms and, and the idea of learning you know, what do teachers really need to know to best support emergent bilingual students is at the top of my mind as we develop this PD module. And then maybe there could be work on sort of a knowledge survey in the future in order to measure 
that knowledge. Mm. Thank you for ending with that. I, as you were talking, I was thinking deeply about our experience together, our conversation, our tea time, right? And what I appreciate mo the most, I think, about this conversation is that we dove into very specific topics very deeply, right? That when at first glance, and I think when we talked about at the beginning, you have had such a wealth of knowledge and experience across a number of different topics in reading and literacy. And I appreciate the fact that we chose a couple that we could really dive into deeply. And I'll say this as we close, one of my values is curiosity. And I always feel energized by an experience, particularly a podcast interview, when I talk to a guest and it just spurs further curiosities and learning, like need for learning. And that's what this conversation was. I mean, from talking about early readers and kindergartners to your work with English learners to adolescents to now offering some thoughts for teacher knowledge, that to me, like, is just making me want to learn more, not from you, from the research. And then the other piece is I really appreciate we, how you brought in some of that implementation science and evaluating some barriers and facilitators to moving research forward. So just in closing, I, I really appreciate all those insights and those notes of wisdom that you really brought in for us for moving, moving this work forward. So thank you for so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for being on this podcast and joining me for some tea. And thank you to all our readers, whether you had tea or not, for listening to Dr. Hall on this episode of The Read Podcast. You can learn more from this episode by accessing our free read bookmarks, where you can visit each episode page at readpodcast.org or thewindwardschool.org slash WI. We also invite you to continue to engage with us on our website where you can find current professional development offerings and free lectures like our spring lecture that's coming up with Dr. Nadine Gab. You can also continue the conversation with me and our team on our social media platforms, including Facebook, X, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So here's to a new spring season of learning in research, education, and advocacy. And Dr. Hall, at the end of each episode, we always say until next time, readers. And I love when the guests, especially those that give us such deep <laughs> curiosities and learnings to say until next time, readers. So will you give our official sign off? Yes. Until next time, readers. Thank you so much. Yeah.